Um, it's fantastic to uh, be here presenting to uh, the Australian New Zealand uh, library community again uh, for several reasons. Firstly, actually, because I am, I'm not anymore, I was a librarian and uh, one of my roles was as a um, uh, research support manager at the University of Sussex um, many years ago. So the work that you do is very close to, to my heart. Um, and also, really, just because whenever I, I speak with with this community, um, with, we always I always get so much uh, really good engagement, some difficult questions, and I know that you um, are fantastic advocates both for open access and for the work that DOAJ does um, in your region. So I, I want to to thank you for that. So I've shared my slides. Is, uh, can I just check that you can see those okay? Thank you, Joanna. Yes, we can. Great. Okay. So the subject I wanted to cover today is something which I think is very important for all of us at the moment. Um, you only need to open, uh, open a journal or a blog post around um, scholarly publishing at the moment and, and you will hear that there is a crisis of trust in scholarly journal publishing. So I want to look in more detail around what, what trust means, what are the different elements of trust, particularly I suppose looking at it from, from my organisation's perspective and what role can we all play in, in upholding that trust. So I hope that you're all familiar with uh, DOAJ, but if you're not, um, I will just briefly uh, introduce my organization to give a little bit of context. So um, as Jay Shri mentioned, we are a, a unique um, extensive index of peer reviewed open access journals. But behind that, we are an organization uh, with a much wider mission, which is about raising the profile and the visibility, the impact, the reputation of all open access journals. And I think that the all is very important there um, because we, we do focus very much on making sure that we, um, we include all geographical areas, um, as many languages as possible um, and as many disciplines as possible. The way that our index works means that every journal that wants to be indexed needs to apply to us. Um, and we use their application um, and, and mark that against our evaluation criteria. And be because of this, our criteria have become, they've been, they're now seen as a, a gold standard for open access journal publishing and are trusted uh, across the, the scholarly community by funders, uh, publishers uh, and researchers. We are a um, non-profit community-led organization. Um, we rely almost entirely on the support from the community, in particular um, libraries and institutions. Um, and because of this, this means we can um, make sure that our core services and our metadata are provided completely free of charge to everybody. I won't go into a huge amount of detail about our history, just to say that we were we were founded in, in the wake of the uh, Budapest Open Access um, Agreement. Um, and that really quite soon, I suppose within the first 10 years, our role became more than just indexing open access journals and began to include an element of trust because we, we began to see around 2013, 2014, um, predatory practices beginning to, to start in, in open access journals. So that's when we, we toughened up our inclusion criteria. And since then, really, we've been de developing our work to address uh, questionable publishing. Um, this illustrates, this map illustrates um, what I said about the uh, you know, trying to cover as many um, geographical uh, areas as we as we possibly can. Um, There's no surprise that we have great strengths in 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 perhaps the UK and the, and the US, where many of the major publishing houses are situated. But you'll see there are also you know we're very strong in um, Latin America, also in in countries like uh, Spain and in Italy. Um, and this is where we stand at the moment in terms of numbers. Uh, we're, the, 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 the index is growing steadily and we're approaching um, 21,000 journals now. 
And very briefly, um, in, in terms of uh, this community, um, every time I present, I'm really pleased to see that the number of journals that we index from Australia and New Zealand is increasing. Um, that's a really good sign. We know that we get really heavy usage from, from your community, in particular um, because uh, so many of you use um, Alma and, and Primo as your library systems. We're also very grateful for the financial support that we receive from um, your community um, to enable us to carry out our work. And I also just wanted to mention that we are beginning to be included in uh, research funder policies in the region, um, particularly now that uh, that the NHMRC as a, as a Coalition S partner uh, makes use of the journal checker tool and, and DOAJ's metadata is a part of that. So back to this uh, crisis of trust in scholarly journal publishing. Um, and I I'm, I'm, don't want to spend too much time on this because <laughs> you could have an entire presentation on, on all the problems. But really, just to, to summarise some of the issues that we're seeing, and a lot of it goes back to um, what we've just heard out about, actually, that, that focus on research productivity as part, of, um, as part of the assessment process. So this kind of publish or perish culture that we've seen in research, which means that you know, authors are under more and more pressure um, and are perhaps sometimes willing to uh, cut corners to ensure that they get their publications out and they get credit for them. Um, we are seeing uh, questionable journals and other bad actors uh, springing up to try and exploit this system um, through, through financial means. And there's also the nump sheer volume of, of articles being produced is putting a real strain on the peer review system, making it a bit easier for bad practices or, for example, gen AI generated papers to get through the system. And of course, the consequences of all of this are bad for all of us. Um, the public trust and research will uh, disappear. It means that we're getting poorest quality research in the system. It means that the, the overall quality of research will go down as these papers begin to get used and cited. Um, and the, it, it, it leads to an overall threat to the credibility of, of academic research. So now I, I want to, to, to use DOAJ and our experience of the last 21 years of, of upholding trust within this system to reflect a bit on, on what are the elements of trust and how can we build more trust into the system. So the first area I want to focus on, which potentially the most important area, is that of transparency. Um, and that goes across the, the whole uh, research enterprise, of course. Um, and it is about us being as, as, as open as possible and as close as necessary, as, as we, the language we know from um, our research data management work. So transparency is really the cornerstone of trust. Of course, it, it, it enhances credibility by opening up uh, the door to what's going on behind the scenes within the research process or the publication process. And it also demonstrates uh, a, a publishing organizations or a research organizations commitment to ethical standards. And of course, through that reduces um, misconduct. So these are the ways in which DOAJ is, is trying to work in a more transparent way. So our governance model and our finances are available on, um, on our web pages for the community to see. Um, we've also adopted um, the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. I hope you're all familiar with them. They are a set of principles that were established by Jeffrey Builder and Cameron Nalon um, a few years ago, and an increasing number of uh, open infrastructures are adopting these principles and measuring themselves against, uh, against the principles, being very open about where they are, are meeting requirements around uh, transparency or openness or sustainability or governance and identifying areas for improvement. We are um, transparent about the criteria 
that uh, that we use. So there were no surprises for journals applying to the index. There's no secret code to getting into DOAJ. And we're also trans transparent about the journals that we add to the index and that we've removed from the index. And we also share important decisions and our plans with, with the community. I just wanted to share this um, framework with you. I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. It comes from the Next Generation Library Publishing Project in the US. Um, it's called the Forest Framework, and it's all about uh, helping scholarly communications uh, organizations and communities to demonstrate, um, evaluate, and, and hopefully um, improve their alignment to a set of key values. And one of those key values is transparency. Um, and I'd really recommend this as a, as a toolkit if you're thinking about your, your own work, perhaps, and how you could be more transparent in, in the work that you do. Um, it's a really useful toolkit. And it's, DOAJ was involved with a, with a pilot uh, project to look at our own processes around transparency. And it really helped us to challenge the way that we do certain things and what we do make uh, available to our community and what we do kind of keep behind closed doors. Uh, as, a, as a result of that, actually, we um, last year we relaunched our publisher supporter model, but made it very transparent on our web pages for the first time. So I, I definitely recommend that as something to look at. Um, the other side, of course, to being transparent also means uh, admitting when you've made a mistake. Um, and I just wanted to. To, to share this example with you. This is where we, um, in response to community concerns about uh, the, the, the prevalence of, of special issues and concerns about editorial oversight, um, we went through a process where we, we consulted with um, COPE and so the Committee on Publication Ethics and also OASPA, so the Open Access Scholarly Publishing Association, to, uh, to develop some new criteria uh, for DOAJ around special issues. Um, one of the criteria included that, uh, that no journal should be indexed in DOAJ if it retire, uh, relied entirely on special issues. Um, and we had to take a step back when our community came back to us and said, you know, that's not gonna work. We're, we're humanities, a humanities journal, we're a social sciences journal. We're a re reputable journal, but this is our this is our publication model. So, so at that point, we had to uh, make a change to our criteria and essentially uh, open up to the community about about that. Um, and we're not transparent in all cases. So, for example, we don't publish journals that have applied to us to be indexed, but that we have rejected, um, and we also don't. Uh, publish a list of journals or publishers that have been excluded from the index. Um, and this is something that we discuss with our community quite regularly, and we also discuss internally. Um, but we feel very strongly that our mission is about championing open access journals um, and supporting them, helping them to improve standards. It's not about punishing um, journals who are, who are trying to improve their standards. And I just wanted to also give you a quote from a consult, uh, consultation we did last year with, uh, with journals that, who had applied to be indexed. Um, and and this, I thought this quote was really interesting because it was from a journal that had been rejected, had gone away, um, done some work on their journal and, uh, and around copyright and licensing, come back to us, reapplied successfully. Um, and it led me to think, well, what, what would have been the consequences for that journal if they had been rejected and we had pasted their, you know, posted their name on the list of rejected journals? Because there's all sorts of reasons for rejection. 99% um, of the time, it's not due to, to you know, to, to predatory practices. It's due to perhaps not understanding something about copyright or licensing or needing to make smaller changes around transparency to, to your website to improve um, information for your users. The second um, area I wanted to look at around trust was about community, because I believe very firmly that, that, that community, that community ownership of research um, is what's really important in terms of, of building trust. 
One particular part is around the, the standards that we all use um, within, within research and within re research publishing. I think it's really important that those are community led and not decided um, arbitrarily by a, a commercial uh, organization. And I wanted to give this um, as, as an example of that. This is the principles of transparency and best practice in scholarly publishing. These were first put together in 2013 um, by these four organizations, of which uh, the OAJ is, is, is one of them. And one of the key um, players behind this, uh, these principles was um, Ginny, Ginny Barber, who I know is, is known to all of you. Um, and these, at the time these principles came out, there were no other guidelines for publishers and good publication practice. So these really um, help to kind of establish what best practice is for, for publishers and for journals, to improve standards uh, across the board and to defend publishing really against questionable practices. And these have gone through several iterations and, and the last one, the fourth iteration came out in, in 2022. So I'd encourage you to, to have a look at, look at those. And another example uh, of, of a community-led standard, which I wanted to share with you today, is uh, the Diamond Open Access Standard, which has very recently been um, produced by the Diamas Horizon Europe project um, and is being used uh, by them to, uh, to create uh, a, 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 the, the Diamond Discovery Hub, which essentially is a list of, of diamond journals in Europe. Um, the issues with creating community-led uh, standards, of course, are around consensus um, and, and, and bringing people together. Um, so this is, this is an, I suppose, an, an almost a first attempt by the European community to establish, to put a stake out there, say, this is what we believe Diamond is going to be. And I think it'll be interesting to see how that develops over the coming years, in particular with the, the kind of the global Diamond uh, Summit and the, the federation that, that, is, that is growing up around that. So it's not just about the standards. I think it's also about ownership of um, organizations is also about how organizations engage with community that, that builds trust. Um, why is that important? Well, I think community-led organizations um, cannot usually be bought or sold, and that's very important because that means they're gonna, we know they're gonna stay with the community. They're also, um, committed to openness, diversity, diversity and accountability. And that's really because they, they prioritize the needs of their stakeholders and not shareholders. So they can, um, they can reflect the values of the community. The other thing I think is very important about community legal organizations is that they're not competitors and they collaborate with other open infrastructures to, to drive change um, in the system. And I just wanted to give some, uh, some examples of initiatives, collaborative initiatives that are happening uh, you know, across um, scholarly publishing to improve the system. Actually, all of it, these, of course, we're, we're involved in as an organization. But so the first is the Open Access Journals Toolkit, um, which is really for um, journal editors uh, who are looking to either develop a new journal or perhaps flip an existing journal to, to open access, and it's full of uh, advice. Um, the Publishers Learning and Community Exchange is a place where, uh, where publishers, editors can, can go and get advice on, on particular issues. So again, if you're providing uh, your community with advice on where they can go um, to find out more about publishing, um, or a particular problem, then, then that's a good place to, to direct them. Um, other community projects are the, the, the Jasper project, where we're looking to um, improve support or pre digital preservation, actually, for um, smaller, usually diamond open access journals. And we're working with PKP, um, ISSN, 
and um, Internet Archive on finding affordable solutions. And then finally, and I really hope you uh, are aware of this, this, this last tool and are using it actively, um, perhaps both in your own work and with your research community, the Think Check Submit Initiative, which is uh, has a, a large number of members now from a, across uh, scholarly publishing, um, which is really about making helping researchers to think about where they either use their, use research or submit uh, research to be published. So making them think about trust, you know, what, what is trustworthy? How do you evaluate that? Um, and finally, one other way that we're looking to bring community into our work at DOAJ is through a new um, editorial advisory group. Obviously, we have community governance of the organisation, but this is really to provide a sounding board for uh, our edit editorial team to enable them to be as up to date as possible on what's happening within publishing, to test out ideas around um, how we're applying our criteria um, and to make sure that we understand different practices in, in different disciplines and geographical areas. And that's why you can see organizations, for example, um, African Journals Online uh, or JSTAGE from Japan or Latindex um, represented in that group. Um, I hope you, uh, some of you did uh, respond to our community survey that we ran earlier this year. I just wanted to give a very quick update on, on that because of course that's a very important way of engaging with the community. Um, this was all about how we, uh, how, understanding how you, our community, use us and, and help us to plan and, and prioritize changes to our metadata over the next a uh, few years, and we, we saw some really strong numbers of responses from across the world. Um, one of the things it did confirm is that DOAJ is used very differently depending on where the world, where in the world you are and, and who you are. So, for example, we found out for, that for re the research community in Latin America, they are really using DOAJ as a search system, so almost as an alternative to Scopus Web of Science. So they're very interested in, in that kind of search functionality that we provide, whereas um, others are now in other areas, uh, areas of the world, particularly, for example, Europe or Australasia, you're generally using DOAJ through other systems. So you're making use of our metadata through, through for example, Primo and, and Alma. But we will be sharing more information on the findings from that survey um, and, of course, you know, any follow up actions that we take. Um, maintaining trust requires investment, and I think this is a really important, uh, a really important point to, to to take on board. It is not um, something that we can take for granted. Um, these are our statistics from last year. You can see just how many applications we receive from journals wanting to be indexed, and how few we actually um, uh, accept for inclusion. Um, and, and then this is this is a process that we take or most journals will take through the system. So they will go through and be reviewed by members of our editorial team. And then we will provide um, the publisher with feedback on the decision and particular. Well, we'll tell them obviously if they're successful, but then perhaps one of the most important things is letting them know if they're not successful, why that is and what they need to do to to improve. Um, one thing I did want to highlight was the, our quality team, uh, because this is this is where we really do need to put uh, a, a significant amount of investment behind the scenes. And this is a team of experts who really work to dig out uh, and investigate uh, questionable practices. And these can be things that come in through the evaluation process I just showed you, or because you've got in touch with us to let us know that you think there's something uh, there's a, a, a journal that's uh, displaying very strange practices in, in the index. Um, they will use all sorts of information um, and, and well, they will also get in touch with the publisher and follow up and even ask for peer review reports um, if necessary. Um, 
and that can result in excluding journals or publishers for, for up to up to three years. So these and these are some of the statistics from just from that team around the numbers of investigations that we're carrying out, the amount of time that we're using on this um, and what the results are in terms of of the journals that, you know, that are not just rejected, but actually excluded from from DOAJ and asked not to apply again for, for a period of time. Um, and and, and the final uh, point around trust or consideration around trust I wanted to mention is that it's not set in stone. What counts as trusted can can change over time as the as the scholarly publications uh, landscape evolves. So um, and here are some examples, really. So the, the first one, um, endogeny, which is where journals uh, publish a high number or publish articles from within their own editorial board members. That's something that is a it can be a sign of uh, questionable practices um, within a journal. Um, it's something that we, we noticed was increasing within DOAJ. And so we introduced a, a, a top level for the number of articles or the percentage of articles that can be included within a journal um, from board members. I talked about the, the special issues uh, uh, problem that we face as a community and what we, the steps we've taken to, to address that. Um, of course, uh, the current issue is the in increasing reliance on AI tools, and, and that's across the system. That's by, by authors, by reviewers, by editors, um, and what DOAJ's role might be in, um, in addressing that or requiring uh, publishers to be transparent about, about their policy. And then, of course, we don't know what's what's next, what's around the corner in terms of, of what what might come next in terms of challenging trust within the system. So those are my reflections around around trust and around um, what my organisation can do to to support that. Um, but I would like to end with some some takeaways. So I also wanted something for you as research support librarians and how you're working to promote trust. And of course, that's that's what librarians are all about. It's about promoting trust in, 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 in peer reviewed and high quality research. Um, but here are some very concrete steps. Um, I think it's important to empower researchers not just to rely on checking for journals in Scopus or has a high impact factor, or actually even if it's in DOAJ, but to really think about um, where they're submitting their research and to take active steps and to be on the lookout for some of these practices. So using a tool like Think, Check, Submit is a really good idea. The second is, uh, and I'm sure that th this is already embedded into all the work that you do, but about increasing the transparency and reproducibility of their research. And that goes all the way through um, the system. So from, from, from data sharing to you know, thinking about open peer review uh, to, to, to sharing research in other ways. And then finally, um, I think it's, it's important to to support community-led organisations um, and publishing models, because um, I I believe very firmly that 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 trust is ours. It belongs to the community, and it's up to us to shape it and to decide what counts as trusted and what doesn't. And that's how we build a healthy scholarly publications ecosystem in the future. <laughs>